So welcome to the Kingdom Community Apostolic Roundtable. Just go ahead and we'd love to hear from you guys. Just go ahead and type in the chat. Let us know if you can hear us. Very, very important. I'm going to actually check on my phone. This is the first time doing this, of course, so hopefully everything is working well. And uh, yeah. Okay. One. Let's see what we got here. Okay. Nobody yet. Nobody yet. Um, chat. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Hey. I can hear you. Great. Thank you so much, Carlos. Awesome. Very good. That's what we want to know. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, being patient with us as we use a new technology for this live webinar. Thanks for joining us. And we're going to be talking about the apostolic tonight. And uh, I know you guys are going to really enjoy this. The video replay will be available for those of you who were not able to jump on the live. So we're going to just open up with a word of prayer. And we're going to jump right into the questions. Of course, we need to understand why would we want to talk about the apostolic? Why is that so important? Well, we'll you'll understand tonight as we make this relevant to the time that we're living in particular. It's not just about philosophy or theology, but there has to be a practical expression of this on the earth. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just ask um, Apostle Kevin Forlong, would you just lead us in prayer just to open up this session? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to just share together around this critical issue that's affecting the church globally at this time. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and minister powerfully over this next period of time. We ask you to anoint our minds, clarity of thought, clarity of expression, and to speak what you want and, and, and to just flow with you through this time. And we thank Amen. you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. So everyone who's watching, just would you go ahead and type in the chat? Just let us know where you're watching from. We see uh, California, other places already. That's awesome. Bless you guys so much. So the apostolic uh, apostles, you know, of course, in the very beginning of this discussion, uh, we're going to have to establish a precedent here. Uh, is there actually such a thing as an apostle in the New Testament uh, beyond the early church? You know, and certainly that's that's a question that we we will be addressing. But uh, the understanding, the culture, the real purpose, and the mission behind the apostolic is very very important. And so from the very beginning, we need to set the record straight, I believe. What was the purpose and the function of apostles in the early church? Very, very important. So here's question number one. I'm going to throw it out, and any one of our panelists will be answering as they, as they would like to. They can just jump in. But before we actually ask the question, let me introduce our panel to you. All the way from Toronto, Canada, Prophetess Hope McDowell Gibson. Thank you for being Thank you with awesome. us. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Awesome to have you. Look, we're a little bit top heavy with the Canadians here, it looks like. Um, <laughs> Derek Bat was supposed to be with us from South Africa. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to uh, join us. But uh, we've got several Canadians on the call, notwithstanding myself, even though I don't live there anymore. But all the way from Vancouver, British Columbia, we have Apostle Denise Adams. Denise, please. Praise hey. God. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Ah, it's great to have you. And let's we'll mix it up a little bit. We'll we'll just move to another side of the world for a second, all the way from Queensland, Australia. Um, Kevin, thank you so much, Apostle Kevin Forlong, for joining us. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. And then from um, the other part of Canada, which is the French-speaking part of Canada, 
Quebec, Montreal, Quebec, we have uh, David Hibbert, who functions apostolically as well. Thank you so much for being with us, David. Yeah, good to see you. Awesome. And of course, my name is Glenn Blakeney. I uh, reside in Dallas, Texas, and awesome to, to be with everybody. So guys, here we go. First question. <laughs> Anyone who wants to answer, you just go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll make room for everybody, obviously. So the 12 apostles that Jesus appointed, Luke's account says he spent the night in prayer. You know, that maybe it was somewhere around the one year mark. And uh, he goes up into the mountain. He spends the night in prayer. He comes down and out of the multitudes, the disciples that were following him, he chooses 12 to be Ooh. apostles. And different uh, gospels, this, Mark specifically says that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach, and heal the sick and cast out demons and so on. So he chooses 12. So obviously there are some who believe beside the 12, um, you know, when the New Testament canon was finished, there's no place for apostles today. Well, what about uh, our panel? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Are there apostles today? Um, yeah, and let's see if we can back this up scripturally. Who wants to go first? <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> look, I think one of the things uh, that's um, so evident in the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. And he introduces himself very clearly as an apostle in a number of his writings, his epistles, and he tells the story of that both uh, we, we get that both through the book of Acts and through Corinthians in, in particular. But then from that, if we um, understand 1 Corinthians 12, 28, that it says very clearly that God has appointed first in the church apostles and prophets and so on. Uh, and the uh, critical factor, I think, is also in Ephesians 2, 20, where it talks about the foundation of the church being built is upon obviously Jesus, but then upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So for the church to be effectively built according to the pattern that God intends, then there has to be apostolic prophetic ministry uh, foundationally involved in the ongoing development of the church. And uh, Paul identifies himself as a master builder and understanding the strategies of heaven and being able to uh, build that, outwork that in the earth. I think, uh, you know, those kind of things point to the fact that we really need to see uh, apostles in the church and, I, and and recognized and functioning. And of course they are, uh, but I do think there's been such a huge uh, focus on leadership over the last uh, mm. numbers of years now that has caused people to lose sight of the critical nature of each of the fivefold ministries and the grace gift that they are to the church and the anointing that they bring, what they carry. Uh, and uh, the best, you know, leadership in the world doesn't address those sort of things. So, you know, that's, that's an introductory bit for me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. So would you say um, in certain places, there's obviously a lot of emphasis in different really streams of, of charismatic Pentecostal Christianity. There's been a strong emphasis on leadership. You know, it's yeah. not it used to be preaching. If you could preach, then that's all that mattered. And then we've seen a transition into leadership. Well, you've got to be a great leader read books on leadership, all that stuff's important. But there are some that really um, equate strong leadership to being an apostle. Have, right. have you seen that? And what are your thoughts on that, Kevin? Yes, I think that's very evident. And, and um, I think in probably from the early 90s on, there came a big influence on... on um, leadership 
and uh, it become the panacea for everything. And I do think a lot of people identify, as you say, uh, apostles uh, by the fact of uh, the strength of their leadership. But leadership is something you can learn. We all need to develop good leadership skills. So that mm -hmm. does not address the need for the apostolic anointing. And I think the kind of hallmarks to me that define that is that an apostle uh, will not only uh, be able to build on the on the earth, uh, you know, according to the revelations of heaven, but also uh, is a power ministry, as Paul says in in one Corinthians uh, two and uh, in one Corinthians twelve, that you know the signs of an apostle or signs of wonders and miracles, uh, a critical part of that, and and um, creating an an, um, uh, an atmosphere. For the release of the supernatural so dealing with the spirit realm breaking open heaven over cities regions and nations um you know that kind of thing i think it's a critical component uh they might have leadership skill but is that that grace and then the governmental wisdom um you know those kind of things that are evident in the life of an apostle yeah okay great thank you someone else please well, I just find it um, interesting when you ask the average person, even a, a Bible school graduate, um, how many apostles were there in the Bible? And right away, they default to 12 without even thinking. They go, oh, there's 12. And then so you say, so then Paul was not an apostle. Oh, well, yeah, he was a special case. Well, what about Matthias? Well, he replaced Judas. So there were still only 12. Well, what about Barnabas? Well, what about, and, and it's it's really amazing because most people know there's more than 12, but they're afraid to mention it for whatever reason. And, and I think mm. if you just even have a concordance, uh, you can come up with about 20 by name, very clear. Mm -hmm. If you also mm. use the Greek uh, and you know how to you know, read a little bit, you can come up to about 26. Uh, and that's kind of my final, that's, well, I should say my final number, but um, by looking at the Greek, the word apostello, you find there's actually about 26, mm -hmm. including Jesus, our chief apostle, is one of the 26. Mm -hmm. But then there's some really interesting other verses that uh, we could look at that even suggest there may be more. But um, mm -hmm. so, you know, the, the question was, how many were there in the Bible? And I think we can come up with at least 26, 24 plus two called the other brothers who were called mm -hmm. apostles. And then, as I said, you could add some more if you if you if you want to go into discussion. But you got to look at um, Luke chapter nine and ten, especially. I'm sure Glenn could go there too. But um, so let's just for safety say twenty four to twenty six. Okay. <laughs> All right. Right now, there there were and there is in the book of Revelation reference to the twelve apostles being the, the pillars in the temple and so on. Uh, so there's obviously a distinction between those 12, which, you know, were more foundational in the sense that they were representative of Israel and so on, but ultimately, and in even perpetuating, obviously, what God had come to do in terms of establishing, um, but these other apostles, you know, we, I think, let's talk a little bit about the criteria, you know, David mentioned how the successor of of Judas Iscariot, obviously, I mean, uh, he had to be one who was with Jesus and, you know, back from the days of John and had been around during Jesus' day and so on. So what's the difference between those guys who had actually been with Jesus and why did Matthias actually have to fulfill that criterion, you know, versus um, those other apostles you referenced? David, why don't you why don't you speak into that? You're on a roll, oh, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the you know the the twelve were are known specifically, like we have the twelve patriarchs in the Old Testament. Uh, we have the twelve apostles in New Testament, which are called specifically the apostles of the Lamb. Okay, uh -huh. they spent three and a half years with Jesus, and then Matthias, who was there, had seen Jesus, also took the place of Judas. But then, as uh, um, 
Ephesians says that after the risen Christ, right, Christ rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven. And then it says that uh, in Ephesians 4 that then Christ, when he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven and he gave gifts to men. Then it talks mm -hmm. about the fivefold ministry. And mm -hmm. so there was a new pouring out of apostolic function on, on people that were not part of the original 12, right? So, so really, um, when, you know, when you consider, you look in the Bible, the word pastor, which everyone talks about all the time, and it's only mentioned once in the New Testament, unless you look at the word shepherd also, which is what a pastor does refer to. And then you can see a few extra verses, but that's nothing compared to the number of verses that uh, refer to the apostle. And so when you look at the, as I said, 24 to 26 apostles uh, referenced uh, 24 by name and additional two, but then because like we don't question that there are tens of thousands of evangelists in the world today. We don't mm -hmm. question that there are hundreds of thousands or millions of pastors in the world today. We don't even question in most circles that there aren't tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of prophets and, and, and uh, prophetesses in the world today. But we mm -hmm. seem to have trouble with this apostolic thing, even though if we go with what's in a sense most important, we might have to look at the apostolic because when Ephesians 4 until um, we come to the fullness of the knowledge of the yeah. son of God, right? We're mature, we're equipped. And that's certainly not happened at all. Right. We're, we're not right. as a church fully equipped yet. And so to me, um, the, the apostolic is critical in this hour in, in, in its many expressions. And, you know, I think there was a, uh, a teaching went around for a while that, well, no, no, the, the apostles were the ones that wrote the Bible. And since we have mm. the Bible, we don't need apostles anymore. Right. But right. no, there's many of the apostles who's, who never wrote any books of the Bible. That mm. wasn't really, mm. you know, there were some that established pre the truth, mm. but there were many other apostles also that did, that never wrote a word in, 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 in the, our Bible, but were uh, very functional and um, very effective in the, in the first century. And I think today, yes, we, we, the canon's closed, but we desperately still need the apostolic function. As, as mm. Kevin referred to, the building foundation, uh, releasing present truth, authority, spiritual uh, warfare, or changing principalities. Or okay, so down don't say too much. Stuff. You're answering another question oh, now. Boy, so. okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't get me started then, Glenn. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, but no, that was no, excellent. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. All right. So um, let's deviate a little bit from the script here. And I, I always love to be kind of impromptu in the sense of just following the Holy Spirit giving place. So I'm going to ask a question about in Acts 13, we read that there were um, prophets and teachers in the church, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, Saul, who was his Roman name, Paul, um, and then Barnabas, right? You know, so we see that, but then next chapter, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 14, all of a sudden, Paul and Barnabas are both called apostles. Mm. Now, I would love to hear your input on that. I mean, what happened there? Before we get you guys to jump in on that and give your response, let's ask our audience. We want to hear from you guys. Some of you sent in questions, but go ahead and type in a question in the chat that you have for the panel. Uh, it has to be about the prophetic. And, you know, don't ask if Adam had a belly button or. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be on a, a TV program years ago called Ask the Pastor. And, you know, they, that was always there was a few questions that always came up. And and of course, the <laughs> one on them was, well, who did Cain and Abel marry? And then yeah. uh, that type of thing. But ultimately, let's keep our questions relevant to the, the subject of the apostolic, that topic. Go ahead and um, type in any questions you have. We'd love to hear from you guys. Let us know where you're watching from again, please, uh, just so we can recognize you. And we really appreciate you joining us. All right, so let's talk about that. Acts 13, Paul, um, Barnabas, Saul, he, he was called there. 
you know, um, there's some just what, who was, who was the prophet, who was the teacher. And some of my studies have seemed to indicate that Barnabas was actually the prophet and Paul was a teacher. Saul was a teacher. And, um, yeah, but, but then in the next chapter, all of a sudden they're both identified as apostles. So what happened? Um, would you like me to, uh, if I could just jump in? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, yes. Thank you, Providence Hope. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think that um, the primarily distinguishing um, mark that we're seeing is the fact that they were identified, like you said before, as teachers, prophets. Mm -hmm. But then something happened in that they were worshiping, and then uh, hands, leadership hands were laid on them. And so mm -hmm. they were sent and they were sent by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. which means they were commissioned. And this is exactly what the word apostle means. It means to be sent. It means to be commissioned. So prior to mm -hmm. this, they were known as, like you said, mentioned before, teachers, prophets. But then something has happened where the presbytery came together and they decided that by the instruction of the Holy Spirit, that these, these men, they are now ready to be sent. So I believe that the, the distinguishing marks right here is their sentness, the fact that they were sent they were commissioned by the Holy Spirit. So we right. see that an apostle is really one that is really commissioned and, re and, yeah. and it is sent. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and of course, the very word in the New Testament language, apostolos, means to be sent forth or sent yeah. out. So and also, very good. Yes, Someone means a messenger as well. Right. We also see even... Um, a Paul's servant, Epaphras, was also sent. Timothy was sent. Silas, they were all sent. So uh, like you mentioned before, there are so many others in the New Testament that when you look at the language, they were sent. They were mm. sent as a messenger because Paul uh, mentioned that Epaphras, my messenger, he was my messenger, which simply means that is really defining what an apostle is. Mm -hmm. so great yes yeah, sent out with authority commissioned obviously by the lord jesus christ ultimately but there's the laying on of hands in acts 13 and it wasn't until the they fasted and prayed mm -hmm. separate saul and barnabas you know mm -hmm. unto the work that i've called them then when they laid on their hands and commissioned them prayed um, then it says they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Right. So, yeah, great. Okay, so um, let's, I'm going to actually pull up a slide here. Um, why is it that apostles are first in the context of the fivefold ministry? For example, in Ephesians 4.11, you know, and he gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Right. Uh, so why is it that apostles are referenced there? First Corinthians 12, 28, and God hath set in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, and so on. Wow. Let's hear from someone. Well, we see that they're foundational. Um, if you look at a house that needs to be built, the first thing that needs to be put down is a foundation. And the apostles lay the foundation of the scriptures of the word of God um, to, in the old, in the in the Testament, New Testament, we see that they initially wrote it. That I'm not talking about the twelve, but the other apostles today now lay the foundation of the Word of God, so that a house can be built upon those things. Until that foundation is laid correctly, um, nothing will stand. I was listening to a construction show, and uh, they were saying a house uh, will not stand or will not pass inspection um unless the foundation is correct if it's uh, faulty it will be a condemned building it will not be allowed to to stand and so with that i, I think that um clearly the foundation is laid by the apostles according to ephesians 2 20 
And uh, of course, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Absolutely. Great. Very good. Very good. Someone want to add to that? Um, uh, I also want to make mention that uh, the fact that the word first is there, it literally means a prototype of something, right? Mm -hmm. And so I believe that the apostle, it's they are first in terms of rank, in terms of their function, and also in terms of their governmental leadership responsibility. So I, that's just my thought. Great, thank you. Yeah, someone else? What are your thoughts? Apostles are first. They're the big, are they the big enchiladas? You know, the, the VIPs. Uh, they're, the master, they're the master builders. <laughs> they're the, master the only guys builders. that get invited to the green room or what? I mean. no, they're, on the bottom. They're, they're on the bottom, they're the foundation. They're just on yeah. the bottom. And, and, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Someone else want to comment on that? I think one of the factors is uh, where Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 4.15 talks about the fact they have many instructors and not many fathers. And I think that, um, you know, going back to the, the previous uh, comments about uh, the emergence of Paul and Barnabas as apostles, I do think that often there is that recognition of an apostle in other areas of ministry before they become identified as an apostle. And part of that is the capacity of governmental wisdom that emerge, that they carry, uh, but also the fathering aspect uh, that um, is, you know, beyond instruction. There is a, a level of care and humility and that kind of thing that embraces people, but at the same time holds them accountable to be effective in their own ministry development and the body begin, you know, the uh, Ephesians 4 passage talking about the body uh, in verse 16, <clears throat> coming to the place where every member is contributing and the, and the body building itself up because of the level of maturity. And I, th I see that the apostle has a critical part to play in that which is really the building of the house and uh, understanding the strategies of heaven the ways of god and uh, being able to outwork that uh in practical ways you know that kind of thing yeah okay great okay very good okay so next question here um sorry let me just pull this up make sure i got this right all right Okay. How did that happen? Let's go back. Here we go. How is apostolic leadership different from pastoral leadership? Can I just jump in? <laughs> of course. All right. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Please this do. is something that I, <laughs> this is something I'm even looking at, even in my own ministry, being a local pastor. So um, there is a clear um, a difference in the sense that, of course, it depends on your grace, your calling. So some are really called a pastoral grace. However, an apostolic leadership is very distinctly different from a pastoral, even though you have pastors who can be uh, apostolic in nature as well. However, a pastoral type of leadership is more about uh, gathering, feeding the sheep, taking care of them, protecting, making sure that they are um, taught the word of God, they are, you know, discipled. While under an apostolic leadership, an apostolic leadership is more concerned about sending out it's more concerned about um, not just, uh, you know, just having pastors, but ensuring that sheep turns into pastors. So uh, an apostle is more about training and equipping. And we have seen this in uh, Ephesians chapter four, that we're to train, we're to equip. So 
that is the heart of an apostle to train, to equip. They are also into ensuring that, uh, you know, believers are not just sitting in the four, within the four walls of the church, but that their mandate is also to go out and to expand the kingdom of God, which is to what? Change mm -hmm. cultures and uh, getting cultures to, to understand about the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereas a pastor, again, they are more protective in nature. They are, are more about gathering, ensuring that, you know, people are fed the word of God, they're taught the word of God. While an apostle is also ensuring that there is also a governmental responsibility of every believer. Okay. Hmm. So this this really kind of segues into a few other questions, but um, let's let's just kind of stay here for a moment. And what are some of the fundamental differences between a pastor and an apostle? Now, of course, we have not um, even mentioned the fact that there are apostles that pastor, <laughs> and so. <laughs> So pastor, as, as David already mentioned earlier, that word, which literally means a shepherd, whether figuratively or, or a literal shepherd, um, is used only one time as a noun. The rest of the time it's used as a verb to shepherd, in other words. So when we talk about pastors, I guess in a sense we're, we're referring to the conventional pastor in today's church, um, you know, without getting into too deep into this, let's just say what's the, the fundamental, some of the fundamental differences between kind of the conventional modern day pastor and, and uh, an apostle who's really functioning as an apostle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Glenn, you um, you talked about the the heart of the. I, I can't remember the words you used. We talked about the, you referenced kind of the heart of a pastor, and and uh, um, re really it, it really is all about heart motivation because you can mm. either be a pastor leading a church or be an apostle leading a church, but your heart mm. motivation is entirely different. And I just jotted yeah. down three words. The focus of a pastor is on the on the church. The focus of the apostle is on a region. I have mm. never yet met an apostle that thinks smaller than a city, right? They didn't yeah. think my neighborhood. They always think at least my city. Uh, the second thing is strategy and uh, was also re already referred to. Pastors bring in, apostles send out, right? Mm. And the third thing was about focus. Um, I'm sorry, authority, authority. Uh, pastors really have a, a lot of authority to care for the congregation the sheep whereas apostles have authority for the people in the region they can speak into governments they can speak into into uh different organizations in the city they can you know can speak into school systems and these things uh but i you know to nutshell that it's all about heart motivation it, it's yeah. it's not so much is what is your title but what is the heart motivation? And, and, and the apostle is always outward focused. The pastor is almost always inward focused. And that's mm -hmm. to me one of the defining issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. I think that um, just simplifying it, the pastor is focused on the local church, whereas an apostle is focused on the kingdom of God. Right. And I can think that the gospel of salvation is which has become you know uh, almost to the exclusion of the gospel of the kingdom and I, I think that a lot of pastors their focus is more on the gospel of salvation whereas an apostle is on the gospel of the kingdom which is very much about proclamation and demonstration not just proclamation of a salvation member uh, a message uh, of individual people committing to christ but it's uh, an apostle thinks more of the the culture of the kingdom being established over a wider region or nations or cities or and the you know can a can a nation come to god in a day that kind of thinking and perspective which is very much involved 
with the whole realm of spiritual, uh, you know, uh, spiritual warfare, the demonstration of the power of God, uh, breaking down of strongholds, all of those kind of things, which I think is more part of the mandate on an apostle uh, than you see uh, being upon a, pas a pastor. Um, which is more focused on gathering and nurturing and protection and security and those kind of things, you know. Okay. So what about those who function in the local church? Uh, and again, understand this, when we look at the local church in the, in the book of Acts, in the New Testament, we see among the Gentiles. I mean, the Jewish believers, they met in Solomon's colonnade, obviously hundreds and potentially thousands of people. That was an outdoor thing. There was no roof on it or anything. But by and large, you know, even in Acts, in the church in Jerusalem, they were meeting in homes. And I, I read a report recently, a, a study that was done. It was an archaeological discovery that the largest, quote-unquote, church gathering um, on the Gentiles that they have found is basically a house church that could accommodate about 70 people, seven zero people. So that's the biggest gathering uh, that is what they were, you know, contending for. Uh, so that's significant in the sense yeah. of what we view. But there were there might have been dozens, uh, but or maybe more of those type of gatherings in a city right, in, in a metropolitan area, because when Paul went to Corinth, that was a capital city of, of Achaia, Ephesus is a capital city of Asia Minor, even Antioch is a capital city of Syria, Jerusalem, and, and so on, so significant, so we have these, we have believers being gathered in houses, but who knows, 20, 30, whatever it may be, in multiple locations, apostles uh, in Jerusalem, not just one apostle, but, a, you know, obviously the 12 were there. So, but we also read in Acts that there were elders in the church in Jerusalem, Acts 15. So there's clearly uh, a distinction between their functions. And would you say that um, apostles are more translocal um like david already mentioned he's never met an apostle who who didn't have a vision like the smallest vision was for a city right it's like at least a city <laughs> and uh but shouldn't pastors have a vision for a city too or should they just be so zeroed in on on just the local house i mean isn't that myoptic isn't that unhealthy just to be viewing on the people that we have in our local church. I mean, let, let's just kind of break that down and, and talk about that a little bit. Well, pastors is very, very necessary. They're part of the five folds. We need every part, uh, every joint supplying. And the apostles will have a, a greater vision. Uh, they bring the kingdom culture. They bring heaven on earth. Um, their, uh, their mandate is specific. But each part of the fivefold um work together we work together as a team and uh, and just having a pastoral view is incomplete in that there is the prophetic view the evangelistic view the teaching view um all of all of them have a view and um each has a part to play in the uh, equipping of the saints and if you just have one part, um, I feel that God's people are missing out on so much. And um, and it's sad because there's so much more in the kingdom of God for us. And as an apostle goes out and, and the desire of an apostle is to see everyone operating in their gifting, one of the things, um, to see a pastor operating well in their function is great, but it's, it is different. An apostle has the ability to go out and um, 
I mean, we see the word term apostle was actually, wasn't it coined from uh, the Roman Empire who, after they mm. took over an area, they would send an apostle in to change the culture. Right. That was the, their, their eyesight, their mandate, where a pastor would take a group of people under their wing and nurture them with the word and feed them with the word and protect them. I think all are so, so important and valuable and we can't do without any part of the fivefold. Okay. Thank you so and, much. Uh, again, Apostle Glenn, I want to ask, would you not say sometimes it's about your the level of grace that is a level of grace that is on your life as well? Because you could start out as a pastor and then you grow into a level of more apostolic type, you know, grace mm -hmm. or in a dimension on your life. And so like you have said, um, Denise, there needs to be also pastoral care because an apostle tend to be a little bit more militant while mm -hmm. there needs to be someone that is giving, uh, you know, an aspect of nurturing. Yeah. And if this is missing, then, so I, I'm just thinking that it's, it has to do with a balancing act mm. in the body so that everything, all the, 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 the entire body is functioning in a holistic way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, someone else want to speak into that? I mean, there clearly was a, a distinction between, say, Paul and other apostles. I think, I think um, and I really don't have an answer for this, uh, Glenn, but um, there's, st there's still some question, uh, maybe, maybe you'll be able to answer my question tonight, and there won't be any question anymore. But um, there's still some question about whether when we when we when we think today, we think of elders in a local church, right? And every, mm -hmm. every church has elders, and the churches can mm -hmm. be hundreds, if not 1000s of people. But if in the early church, like you just said, they were house churches, especially in the first three centuries, there was no church yes. buildings, just house churches. And so you had houses that could only fit a dozen, 20, 25 or so people, most of them. Then it seems to be very reasonable that every one of those houses would be led by a local pastor over that. You could call it a house church, cell group, whatever. And that the yeah. eldership in the first century was a city eldership, not a what we consider today local church eldership. And so yeah. we we've taken a the city eldership and the city apostleship and then the local church pastors and kind of transitioned it. So now we have uh, local church elders and local church apostles, and then we don't know what to do with the pastors anymore. Uh, how do they exactly fit? But, you know, I, I am so glad that in our church, we have a number of people that are very pastoral that can do the pastoral ministry mm -hmm. um, and, and, they, and they look after home groups and they look after pastoral counseling. And so I think some of our struggle with how it all works is because the first church, first century church was indeed structured differently. Right. There yeah. was city eldership, at least my understanding of looking at at the New Testament. It was a city eldership, not a local church eldership. Could you, you want to correct me or speak into that, Glenn? Because I'd like to hear your opinion on that. No, I, I agree with you. I think that mm. we, what we see, like I've got a, I've got a couple of things I could say that are pretty radical, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm not even sure there's fivefold ministry, you know, because we know the New Testament says, and he gave some to be apostles some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors slash teachers, right? There's no comma even in English there. It's not some to be pastors and some to be teachers. It's some to be pastors and teachers is what it says. And the translators intentionally rendered it that way. So if we're looking at elders being pastors slash teachers, Paul talks about that in 1 Timothy 5, that elders should be able to teach. You know, the, the term elders used synonymously, uh, presbyteros, with the, mm -hmm. the Greek word episkopos, which is translated bishop in the old King James mm -hmm. and uh, overseer in some modern translations. Mm -hmm. But the word shepherd is also thrown in there in First Timothy 5 and Acts 20. 
uh, as a verb to shepherd. The elders mm -hmm. and the overseers are to shepherd the flock of God. And so I, I think we, we see a clear distinction between evangelists um, going out, reaching people, going to new places. Philip is, you know, clearly an evangelist in the New Testament in Acts. But I think that the whole aspect of city is kind of the way it was in the New Testament. I, I don't see this distinction where the early church elders or apostles thought any other way. It's like we have all these people in this region, in this city, and, and it was a city and a region, I believe. You know? So, and they, they're like, we have this responsibility to, to reach people, to disciple them, to shepherd them, whatever language. And they did it together and, and elders functioned in that capacity um, of, of overseeing in a city, you know, not just a local, um, even though they may have, like you mentioned, David, they may have a particular group of people that they oversee. Like one of the churches that I used to visit a lot, everything was pre-COVID <laughs> in Singapore. Um, mm -hmm. and actually, they have, I don't know, 25,000 people or so mm -hmm. that gather. And they have a huge facility that they meet and do multiple services. I think their facility seats about over 6,000. Mm -hmm. And yet they have everyone all that comes there is put into a cell group. And yep. they have cell group leaders that are like elders. And then they have um, other kind of pastors, they may call them, who oversee a certain, you know, maybe 20 or 30 of these cell groups, these home groups, house churches, you could call them in the sense mm -hmm. that, you know, they're functioning yeah. that way. So that's very different than what we see typical, typically today. But I think the early church was much more like that is, is what I'm trying to yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone else? I've, I've always wondered, um, apostles, the first uh, influx that came in the early church was 3,000. The mm. Bible said, you know, one day 3,000, you know, were added to the church. Mm -hmm. My question is, was there a, a one assembly gathering of those 3,000 at any one, one time, or was it just primarily house to house gathering? Mm -hmm. Someone want to answer that? <laughs> I think it's a very good question. Um, I think in the first, um, you know, when you go from Acts chapter 2 through to Acts chapter 4, they're meeting in the temple and from house to house. And, mm -hmm. um, but I think as has been pointed out, and it's a very crucial thing, uh, for people to recognize today is there were no church buildings for at least 300 years. And so the, the church was meeting in homes and, uh, and, you know, in the very early chapters of the book of Acts, uh, meeting in the temple at the time of prayer or whatever, but that's, uh, those are Jewish believers. Once you have the Gentile believers, they're no longer going to, they're not going to the synagogue to meet, you know, so any corporate meetings would be in public facilities or as you read in uh, Acts in a couple of places, you know, there was a prayer meeting down by the river that Paul went to and, you know, these kind of things. Um, and, uh, and I think the cell church structure that um, Glenn referred to a moment ago, that is that's a common structure in cell churches which is very much a reflection of the, you know, house church movement, if you like, with a, with a slightly different, um, you, you know, there is a, a, you know, an oversight and it is a local church, but it has several sort of house churches, if you, if you want, or cells within that. Um, 
I imagine that's the kind of structure that the New Testament reflects in the in the book of Acts, you know, the, because there were no buildings and the facilities of public buildings would only have been limitedly, uh, only available to them in a limited way. Um, so, you know, I think there are some things about that we're not really, sh we, we don't really know. And I do think there's enough flexibility in the New Testament model as best we understand it to accommodate various cultural um, you know applications and interpretations but at the end of the day is there still needs to be people that carry the grace of an apostle that are an apostle and people that are, are a prophet and people that are a pastor and really the title they they carry is not you know how we refer to them in some senses doesn't matter too much as long as the functions they're in the body you know yeah. and some people are very big on titles and others are not you know at the end of the day we need those functions and they need to be recognized for what they are and so often it's not what the person says it's about what they carry that influences the atmosphere yes. and the spirit of the place you know a pastor will release a pastoral anointing into a corporate gathering and if they are able to you you begin to generate that that higher level of care and concern for one another bearing one another's burdens and you know those kind of things uh, mm. that flow out of a pastoral gift the same with an evangelist you know that mm. they will begin to motivate and inspire and mobilize people to reach out and share their testimony and do whatever they do you know so it's um i, I think the actual structure itself is not so critical as some people think but more to do with defining the roles and functions within that structure to ensure that there is that expression of the fivefold and you know the pastoral care and whatever else is involved you know right good yeah no there definitely and and there's a lot we could say we probably have to do a, a second or third round table on this um there's so much but let, let's just jump into the next question here um how can well, no, let's go to this one. What are the defining hallmarks of an apostle? So we're talking about an apostle. Uh, you know, what, what are the defining hallmarks of an apostle? We've looked at how apostolic leadership is different. What are the defining hallmarks of the apostle's ministry? I um, <laughs> I do believe that um, you know some of the major signs of an apostle is, and I believe someone mentioned it before, is just a level of grace for fathering, hmm. uh, a level of grace yes, for fathering. Also, I do believe that an apostle they carry the, a hunger for the supernatural mm, and they yeah. want to see the supernatural into manifestation in fact the scripture also mentions that an apostle talk about the fact that he's an apostle with great patience so an apostle has a level of grace for endurance paul speak to the fact that he, he bore the marks of christ in his body so you he, he also spoke about his testimony where he has gone through, you know, several, several um, different trials and even he made reference and he, the burden of the church. So I feel that there's a level of grace and endurance that an apostle carry. An apostle carry the heart of seeing the kingdom of God be established, not just in a local church, but also in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. They want to see uh also governmental structures uh in the church as well i feel that an apostle is also we mentioned this before the one of the primary mark that i look in apostles apostle paul ministry is they carry just a strong teaching gift to see the body of christ developed we saw when paul went to uh antioch Paul and Barnabas, they stayed for what? Two years, ensuring that the church is established, the foundation of the church is established, ensuring that believers were fully trained and equipped. And then at the end of 
that two years, if you notice, the church was the Christians, they were sorry, they weren't even known as Christian. But by the time they were known as little Christians or Christ, because mm -hmm. of the way that an apostle, their heart is to ensure that persons are just trained and equipped to become more like Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. In That's terms great. of their functionality, in yes. terms of their functionality, let me say it like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Someone else would like to jump in? Well, I love the things that she uh, shared on. I fully agree with them. It's wonderful. You know, I, I look at it and I think um, uh, the apostles carry the government of God, establishing the kingdom of God in the earth. Very, very important. Uh, miracles, signs, and wonders will follow them wherever they go. Absolutely. Healings, miracles, um, you know, casting out of the demonic, all of those things are very vital, very, very important. Uh, I look at it and I go, um, they're sent. There's a desire to go. They can't just sit. They can't just be in one place. They have to go and expand the kingdom. It's a heartbeat. It, it's like an itch that has to be scratched, I think, within the hearts of uh, of the apostle. It's just, it, has to, it has to happen. And I think one of the things a lot of people don't understand about apostles is that how come the pastor, they'll call the pastor, how come you have to go on this event? Or how come you have to go over there and do that? How come you have to, it's because it's innately uh, within their DNA that they have to go and um, because they're sent ones. And so mm -hmm. that that word sent is, is uh, marked in their DNA to have to go and to do and to uh, declare the kingdom of God. That's excellent. You know, I was on a web, I was on a um, Zoom meeting recently with an international ministry, and one of the leaders um, actually shared a story about the senior leader of this ministry, and they have a network, and they're, you know, highly respected worldwide ministry. And there was a board meeting or elders meeting, whatever you want to call it. I think it was like a board meeting, and their senior leader who's really an apostle, but also was recognized as the pastor of this house, was um, traveling a lot and going all over the world. And so they actually asked him to leave the meeting and they wanted to have a discussion about um, whether or not they should continue paying him the salary they were paying him. So he, he left the room and... Um, one of the associate le a senior leaders uh, responded to that, like, you know, are we paying him too much? And he said, well, actually, you're not paying him enough because our our calling is to be an apostolic sending center. And mm -hmm. he needs to be taken care of so he can go out to the nations and represent the kingdom. And, you know, what he's doing, too, is obviously that local church was put on the map to the point that so many people started coming to that local church, to their school of ministry in particular, that there was a huge crisis. Like, you know, they might have had a thousand people in the church, but now they've got three or four thousand people in their school of ministry. So, you know, th this whole thing is, is we have to recognize the calling of an apostle. And one of the things mm -hmm. that the traditional conventional religious system, uh, they they don't want that in many places. Mm -hmm. They want a pastor, quote unquote, who's going to be there and love and yeah. take care of all the people. Mm -hmm. And that's really an antiquated role because if we are, um, I'm sorry, a model, that's what I meant to say, because if we have someone who's truly an apostle leading at that level, then they're also going to to be going and yeah. yes you you need to have elders in place and people that can take care of the teaching and the shepherding in different ways but to to build it so that we do have that and so so what about what about this um question apostles and prophets like can they actually work together and if so um what, what would that look like? 
I think it's critical that they work together. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, to me, uh, one of the things is an, uh, an apostle will teach the word of God to challenge the will and mind of people, whereas a prophet will preach the word of God uh, inspirationally to empower, mobilize, light a fire. I think the, the, the apostle builds a structure and the prophet breathes life into it, if I can put it in that kind of way um and uh and i also think that uh one of the things i in acts chapter two where peter stands up on the day of pentecost and he interprets joel's prophecy and gives application to it yes. on that day to give understanding to the experience they've had and i think that kind of, you know the apostles need to be interpreting and applying the prophetic ministry and mm -hmm. the prophetic ministry, uh, you know, working together. And uh, Ephesians 2.20 is very clear that mm -hmm. together they form the foundation for the ongoing right. building of the house, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a critical relationship that we don't see functioning. Well, I'm not aware of it functioning really well that often. You don't see that strong connection. Mm -hmm uh that often uh, in the circles that i'm primarily moving in uh but i think it's a critical thing we're seeing it merge a lot more um mm -hmm. but yeah that would be my perspective okay well, like one, one more person go ahead want to speak into that go ahead i do yeah okay. it's uh vital i found uh, the the one of the biggest keys in ministry is the ability to communicate effectively with your team one-on-one -on -one together. And, and in fact, um, a good example would be that we are having a conference coming up and they have a number of different apostles and prophets around the world in, in our group that have been uh, getting dreams. This one will get a dream, this person will get a dream. They'll feed it in and we'll have our, our prayer meeting. And we're praying over these things together. And I'm, I'm just finding it is so wonderful how um, God will give this person a piece of it and, and God will give somebody else a piece of it. And as we come together to pray together worldwide, it's just so um, it's we've, we've seen tremendous results from doing that um, uh, worldwide, not only here for me locally, but in Indonesia or in Australia or in uh, in the United States. And I think it's really exciting when you actually start to really communicate and synergize together. Um, if there's such a fulfillment, there's such a, a satisfying uh, network of um, building together, helping one another, uh, even though we're at different corners of the earth. I think it's fabulous. It's just awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Denise. So. You know, obviously, when we're talking about apostles and prophets functioning together to rebuild the foundation of the church was a specific question. Um, you know, there there is a call to rebuild on the sense that Paul said in Titus chapter one, verse five, he told Timothy to go to Crete and basically to complete what was not finished. And really, the, the language has to do with uh, essentially finishing something uh, foundational that, that hadn't been um, established properly. And so I think there, there's a place for that. And when we recognize, just like every other person who is in the family of God, we are all part of a body. And, you know, the finger is connected to, to the wrist, to the, to the arm, to the elbow, and so on. We need one another. And we have to function in that capacity. So the fivefold was meant to work together mm -hmm. and not to be out there just kind of autonomously. Well, I'm an, a prophet and, and I'm an apostle and you go and do your thing. Maybe you have a church or you go and speak at various churches. Uh, but, you know, there's no actual collaborating and cooperating. Um, there is clearly... In the New Testament, we see translocal itinerant 
um, mm. prophets, you know, not just Agabus, but it mentions mm. there were others too, and they were traveling and they were going around. In fact, uh, some tradition states that actually Agabus was one of the 70 that Jesus sent out originally and that he became an elder in the church in Jerusalem. So as a prophet, he was an elder, one of the ones that was recognized as an elder in, in Acts. Um, that's what some tradition states. So interestingly, uh, these prophets were connected to apostles. There, yeah. there was this working together. There was a mutual respect and even accountability in the sense. Uh, but often today, we just kind of let people go and do their own thing autonomously, and it's piecemeal, almost like we're not connected. So let's break it down, and how can you see, let's give a very practical example, a prophet and an apostle actually working together. Like, let me just say this, too, before we jump into it. Um, I think we see this in the book of Acts, because Paul right. is an apostle— and mm -hmm. after that rift with Barnabas, he chooses okay. Silas, and Silas mm -hmm. is identified as a prophet. He, so he's got a, yeah. you know, and we, again, going back to Acts 13, Barnabas is also called a prophet in Acts 13. Mm -hmm. So, like, yet he's an apostle. So let's let's talk about that. Who, who wants to jump in on that? We we also see a, a, a model also in the same Acts chapter 13, where we saw, you know, different leaders collaborating and mm -hmm. based on the instruction of the Holy Spirit. So I would say that an apostle, uh, sorry, a prophet could announce a new mm -hmm. direction of the church. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the prophet sees, the prophet hears uh, a message from the Lord. And then therefore the apostle now, it is... The, the the assignment of the apostle to say okay this is how we are going to have this done this is how this these are the strategy this is how we're going to ensure that this is established so prophet would see the vision uh a new direction of where the church is going okay we need to establish uh, uh, uh another branch or another ministry in another region this is the prophets and this is the timing of this while the apostle would say okay let's gather uh those who are, who are going to you know start this work ensure that this is established and ensure that it is done so i i think that this is that would be a practical example okay yeah great. it's that whole thing about um vision and strategy the working together yeah a vision strategy mm -hmm. within a local church uh glenn you've met uh sandy one of my uh, ministers and she's always getting pictures in the middle of the service so she'll just walk up to me she said i just saw this now what are you going to do about it right so she gets the vision <laughs> she knows something's got to be done but she doesn't have a clue what and so on the spot i have to come up with a strategy on how to react <laughs> or respond to what god just showed her and when i do that we have breakout times, right? We just have amazing things happen. But even as was just shared, even on a regional level, the, the prophet again speaks into the vision of what is this thing going to look like? How, where should we go? Um, where should we? Uh, yeah. And then back to the apostle, the, the architect to now build a strategy, make sure it happens and the order and the function and, you know, the, the foundations. And to me, that is so, so important that um, so many of my God ideas started off with a prophetic word from one of our mm. prophetic people. And we, I get to take the, the, you know, the uh, success for it. Oh, look at what Pastor Dave did. Well, I just heard from the prophet and then I developed a strategy for it. And, and uh, you know, whether you have mm. prophets in your church or not, you need prophetic people. So every apostle should be raising up not just fivefold prophets, but also just prophetic people who can still yeah. speak in these issues so that we have, we can build the strategy around it and see the, you know, again, the church advance, the kingdom advance in the community. So it's all about vision and strategy, the two working together. Very good. And that's so exciting okay. too. You look at it, it is so exciting when the prophets are prophesying and the, and the, the pastors are working and it's working together and it's 
everyone's connected, everyone's involved. There's um, God's breathing mm-hmm. on it, and it's exciting. It's exciting mm-hmm. to be a part of, the, of what God is doing in the earth because everyone's supply, every joint really is supplying. How awesome is that? Yeah. 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 And, you know, we said in our in our uh, previous roundtable on the prophetic, we talked about the difference between prophets and prophetic people. And so we have people that will prophesy. They have that gift, but they're not necessarily prophets. Prophets are real, uh, obviously, more in the governing sense, too. And there's a responsibility. So that's that's very important distinction to make. But when someone has inspiration and revelation and they get that, you know, that they're to share then it's clearly um, the the apostles that do that. Because we see that the apostles, Paul, for example, um, was the one who was appointing elders. Um, again, we see that with Barnabas and so on. And, and then we see it later on in Ephesus when he's leaving after being there. There's elders that are appointed in other places. Titus goes to Crete, Timothy, all that. So that's important, but but we have to recognize the place and the role and where we all fit in. And ultimately, there there is a place of um, trust, collaboration, and there needs to be security. And there also needs to be uh, really no vying for platforms or positions or preeminence. Uh, but it's just like, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. And I'm quite comfortable in my own skin my own calling mm. and exactly. and we're secure in that way so uh we're just going to go to a question from that that came in we'll we'll actually go we'll do two questions um so for those of you who are watching i shouldn't be saying um all the time that's a bad habit for those of you who are watching you guys again go ahead and send in a question in the chat if you haven't done that already one of the questions really a good question comes from Joe. Joe is part of the kingdom community. He lives in Honduras. He's a missionary. And Joe asked this question. How do you, okay, he's originally from Texas. So he says, how do you all feel? All right. <laughs> how, do, how do you all feel uh, that apostles differ from pioneer missionaries that open new areas and projects? So again, the paradigm of it's more than a language it's more than semantics but it's a paradigm issue because we have the average bible college you'll go to they'll have you study the book of acts and paul's quote-unquote missionary journeys um i don't have a problem really with that language but my preference is to call them paul's apostolic missions and the reason why I use that language is because I feel it's important to recognize that he was an apostle. He wasn't just a missionary. It doesn't say he gave some to be apostles and some event, you know, prophets and some missionaries or whatever. So I'm not I'm not trying to be facetious here. You know, mm. But what what's the difference here? You know, is there a difference between someone who's a pioneering missionary? And an apostle. That's really, I think, what Joe's asking. Can I uh, speak to that, please? Uh, Glenn? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the, I, I, it, it is an incredibly good question because we use the word missionary, which is not a biblical word, generally to define people who go overseas or cross culturally or whatever. Mm. Uh, but from what my my perception is that. Um, some missionaries are actually teachers going overseas mm. and teaching cross culturally. Some are apostles going overseas and apostling cross culturally. Some are evangelists going mm. and evangelizing cross culturally. And so we've come up with this artificial terminology to mm. define um, people who go outside their own country, even missionaries in Northern Quebec here among, you know, we have First Nations. Uh, but to me, you going with, you know, still using the fivefold terminology, um, mm-hmm. you're going with another anointing. And I really think that uh, this gentleman talked about a pioneering missionary. To me, a pioneering missionary is an apostle because an, an apostle. apostle is a pioneer. But if he was 
going overseas and he was just teaching, he would be going as a teaching missionary or as a evangelizing missionary, right? So to me, the we get confused by the word missionary, whereas really what is the, as was said by everyone here, what is the grace on your life? What is the function? What, what is the expression, the heart motivation, the function that you're going with when you go overseas? And that's really what you have to walk in, the grace that God's given you for a specific function. And if you want to use the word missionary to determine going overseas, but it's it's not like there's, it's not the mission, missionary anointing, it's the apostolic anointing to go apostolic somewhere or the prophetic anointing to go somewhere or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. That's good stuff. All right, here we go, guys. Here's the big question of the night. Are there apostles in the marketplace or do they strictly function in the church? <laughs> I love this question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i think i think kevin forlong should answer this <laughs> uh look to me the answer is simply yes um there are apostles in the marketplace and to take the second part of the question or well, do they strictly function in the church you know the reality is if you look at new testament there was no such thing as a church in the way we think of it today. So go. all of the gifts were functioning in the marketplace. Hmm. And, uh, you know, and if you look at Jesus ministry, most yeah. of his function was out in the marketplace. It was, That's right. you know, on the beaches in the mountains where, you know, through the village or whatever it was. And it really gets back again to what was just said a moment ago about the grace on a person's life. Uh, I have a son-in-law who is a, uh, he's primarily a, a pastor, but he has an amazing ability to heal broken people. And, uh, and he, he, he was on staff with um, our church for a number of years, but he's uh -huh. been in uh, corporate management for the last several years. And he can't help himself because he's a pastor. And so all the broken people in the company find their way to his office. You know, he's always sitting somewhere with broken people. And so it's the same with an apostle. Mm. If a person is in the marketplace with an apostolic gift, they're going to be kicking open doors and making things happen and building stuff and extending stuff. And uh, that expression is just a natural flow of the anointing on their life in the middle of it, of course, they will be uh, very kingdom minded and, and uh, probably leading people to Christ and doing all those sort of things. I've been in, particularly in Asia, you see quite often in um, large, uh, uh, you know, companies and so on, where they'll have their uh, lunchtime service going on a, you know, on a Thursday lunchtime. And I've ministered in a lot of those places, their breakfasts and lunches and things like that in Singapore and KO and stuff. And it's, it's a full on service. You know, they, they don't want you, it's not just a little sharing thing. It's like you're preaching and ministering to people on the power of gods. You know, they want to see the move of the spirit and all that sort of stuff. And, and often that comes out of the apostolic mantle on the, the business people that head that up, you know, they want, they they are breaking ground in the marketplace and seeing you know the um the grace of god working in their business but they also want to see transformed lives and right. uh, so yeah yeah great and and i love the the initial statement um kevin that you know really look at the apostles they they were functioning in the marketplace where jesus was yes and anytime the Jesus or the apostles went to quote unquote the church, the the synagogue, uh, usually it didn't go very well, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, but so that's why they went on the hillsides and yeah. the wherever the streets, the marketplace, um, city centers, gates of the city, whatever. But there's really a, a sense in which we have to we have to recognize that. So we've created this false dichotomy, really, between. Mm -hmm church and marketplace but the church ecclesia had a long conversation about this today actually with some people that are in the marketplace the church is really all about being the ecclesia 
in the earth, ruling, reigning every mm-hmm. segment. Some people call it seven mountains. Personally, yeah. I, I prefer just to look at spheres of influence. I like that better because I think there's yeah. more than seven. But um, I think that we we have to recognize that, you know, that's clear. Mm-hmm. So influencing, bringing the kingdom into every sphere of influence, your your job, whatever it is, you might be an entrepreneur, you might be an executive, you might be um, an apostle who functions uh, really kind of, you know, like just laterally where you're one day you're with an executive, um, like Kevin mentioned he, in Asia, you're with these business people, they're gathering, they're worshiping. How good is that? That's amazing. And then, you know, you might be speaking in, in a gathering, a church, um, quote unquote service or a home meeting. Like, I, I love that, the flexibility to be able to do that. Here we are online, you know, and next week I'm going up to Canada and I'll be speaking in some larger uh, gatherings and then um, some some other churches in, in Ontario and in, in Quebec, even with, with Pastor Dave. And then, like, I'll be going to a... a speaking in louisiana like a tent meeting you know i mean <laughs> I, I love it and it's all wherever and you know meeting with with business people now and and really loving that and enjoying that uh how we can work together and collaborate and reach people as well so but let's let's look at an interesting scripture i saw um actually linda brown posted this the other day she referenced that scripture where the levites and 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 um, the um, priests weren't able to function in their calling because the people weren't supporting them. And so they had to become farmers. That was kind of the trade of the day. And yet when Nehemiah comes along, he corrects them and says, look, you need to start giving. You start, need to start tithing again. So the question that um, we're going to ask here really has to do with how do... Um, itinerant apostles finance and ministry if god's called you not to pastor a church but to travel to the nations um like whatever how do you how do you finance that and what are some of your thoughts apostle um just a note here just before you move on to that question yes i could just mention the scripture was mentioned directly how Apostle Paul was in the marketplace, Acts chapter 17, 17. It yes. says that he was reasoning in the synagogue with devoted person and also in the marketplace every day. So it's mm-hmm. actually mentioned specifically in the scripture that at one point he was in the marketplace daily. So I do believe that yes, apostles really should be in the marketplace. Amen. Great. Amen. Thank you. That's a great scripture. Thank you so much, Prop This Hope, for bringing that to our attention. Great scripture. Excellent. Um, so, you know, we've got people that they don't want to do. Let, let me just qualify this. There are those who are called and are being stirred to do church very differently, especially now coming out of COVID. And like I was on a, a Zoom meeting early this morning with a pastor of a, a, a fairly significant church. And he he said this, he's a young guy. He, he said, I've been talking to my elders and I said, man, why don't we just stop having Sunday services? <laughs> and, and my response to him was, well, <laughs> uh, are you, how are your people handle that one? You know, uh, but realistically, the point is he's trying to he's trying to say, look, we need to get outside of the building and reach people in the community. And our priority is still on the weekend gathering, right? That's where all the money, the time, the energy, the staff, the the team members go into that in in most churches today. Um so so um, I want to do something different. I want to build more of a, a training equipping center that's apostolic, prophetic, 
and bring people in. We may not gather on a Sunday, but man, like to say that's not church, that's not ecclesia, like that's so so but how somebody fund that how does how how do you fund a ministry if you're itinerant you're translocal as an apostle and you're going to be traveling like i think there's people on our panel that actually have experience and are doing this right now <laughs> so let's hear from some of you i've been doing it for 26 years <laughs> oh really yeah. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's well, a good maybe question. not 26 years, but I know that. Yeah. It's been a while. Uh, it's a good question. I'd like to know the answer of it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was hoping you guys would provide We're asking you from your experience. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... Um, I think there's an area where the church needs to really grow, um, you know, broadly speaking. But at the end of the day, I think if you're doing what God's called you to do, mm. he will take care of you. Uh, and and that might sound uh, oversimplified, but that's been our reality. And uh, we do have some churches and individuals and, and business people that have partnered with us financially. They, and most of that has just come out of a real God connection. You know, we, we have never promoted that or very rarely, you, we might've talked to, you know, one or two pastors about it where we've got a lot of in, ongoing input into a church. Um, and generally that's not been large sums, but it's been, you know, people that partnered with us and we've had people partner with us that we've never met. We've gone into a church and God's spoken to them, and then they end up. We've got a couple that are tremendous intercessors for us, and they've been like that for many years. We've never actually physically met them, and um, and so those sort of things. But I do think, uh, you know, there's that whole aspect. Uh, if you're itinerant, you have to have faith for finance. Otherwise, you end up leaning on people or spending all your time praying about money. And uh, so you've got to get that in your in your spirit and then ask the Lord about what is the strategy for you. You know, there are strategies that different ones have. Uh, I mentioned, you know, partnership. I know people that sort of promote that, look for that. Um, but I don't have a real answer to that question. I think it's a faith issue for me. It always has been. I grew up in the days when you never asked anybody about money and you never talked about money, you trusted God and get on with it. Now that may be over simplistic or whatever, I don't know, but that's probably the way we've operated, you know, for, for many years, both in the churches we've planted and also in, you know, personal uh, things. So I don't think I have a good answer to that question. So I'll be interested if somebody else has. All right. Who, who uh, could I ask a follow-up question to this question? My question would be, uh, as an itinerant apostle, should not that apostle be uh, attached to a local house and then the local mm -hmm. house would have the responsibility of saying, okay, this is the apostle of this local congregation. This apostle is being sent. We need to uh, support them financially. They should be a part of the budget. That that would be my question. Yeah. Yeah. I say amen. Yeah. <laughs> amen. Yeah. And we have we have had that to some degree in some of the churches we've been based in at different times. We have moved uh, different cities and nations and things like that in terms of our residents, and so we have been connected with different churches, but. Uh, we have had that happen at various times, but um, yeah. Yeah, and I think the Apostle Paul, when you when you look at his strategy, um, mm -hmm. there was clearly a network. You know, Paul would go, they established churches, but then he would go back and visit those churches. So there was that ongoing relationship. Mm -hmm. So once you begin to build those types of relationships with the, I believe, the local church, um, those that are you're providing covering, mentoring, training, fathering, 
whatever it may be, and I say that generically, you know, in a paternal sense, male, female, but then you've got um, churches that might just say, look, man, we really like what this person is doing. They're making an impact and they want to sow into that ministry. So once you, you build those kind of relationships, um, I think in an ideal world, there should be churches that are coming behind you and right. not just one. It'd be great to have one. Like I know a situation where someone who's prophetic, really a prophet is um, uh, based on a particular local church and they pay him probably two to three thousand dollars a month you know and uh, that that type of thing and, and that helps a lot obviously in terms of you go out there and and especially during covid i mean unless you're going to be like the apostle paul and be bivocational which there's nothing wrong with that either yeah um I, I actually was on a phone call today with an apostle that I know in Chicago, Illinois, and he's a multimillionaire, and he did that through business. But he still is very active in ministry. He's built a team now for his business, and he goes to places, and he doesn't have to he can't say, well, unless you're able to pay my airfare or whatever, you know, I, I can't come. I mean, I get that when you're in a position mm -hmm. where a church is struggling to to be able to do that, but they'd like you to come and, you know, well, maybe they need to save up and plan or whatever I get. And but yet to be in a place where you have those type of resources and you're able to travel to the mission field, do big things because you have money. You know, there's there's more and more people that are getting involved in business. And as was stated earlier, Jesus, uh, Paul was in the marketplace and in mm -hmm. the synagogue. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah also, I have yeah. tent making skills as we speak here. You know, That's exactly what I was going to mention. Well, exactly. We all have things we have to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a combination. It isn't just, oh, we'll do this or do that. I mean, we look at yeah. the Bible, for examples, and we see, you know, there were people who, who funded projects, missionary trips, who helped mm -hmm. uh, with that. And there are people yeah. out there to do that. But to think it's just this one way, mm -hmm. it's not going to be just that one way. And I like what Kevin yeah. said, so valuable, is that you have to ask the Lord. You have mm -hmm. to go to him and find mm -hmm. out for you how that's, what that's going to look like and um, seek his face and have faith amen absolutely yeah 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 great mm -hmm. and clearly if you have resources like i mean the mindset of the church must change as it comes to money yeah. and again yeah. i'm not saying money to live high off the hog necessarily or to live in a a bigger home um I'm not I'm not advocating that what I'm saying is money to fund the propagation of the gospel yeah. helping people yeah. whatever it is so important yeah. we should have access to hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars to be able to do this yeah and in the body of Christ and we need to prioritize it um, and we need to be intentional about it is my opinion yeah. and when you see people that are going and reaching unreached people for example um, like parts of Canada, <laughs> Quebec, unreached people, 0.5% or something evangelical in Quebec, Canada, really. Like that's, yeah. there's, there's places in the world where, you know, what, what a difference it would make. And, and so, you know, I think like what Denise said, it's, it is often it's a combination, you yeah. know, but we're God, because you may have, money yourself but what god's called you to do is even if you had the resources even if you were you know very wealthy and you could pull it off yourself there's still a place for the church to co-labor and partner mm. that responsibility and privilege we get to do this yeah. right it's not that oh man he needs money she needs money 
and we better support them. No, we get to do this, yeah. and we can help them. You know, and become co-laborers for the I truth. I think a lot of people don't grasp the the partnering and what that really truly means. That mm. um, you know, uh, these people are going to be brought into the kingdom of God, and if they what they're partnering with is that is with lives mm. being changed and transformed it's mm. it's it's life and death for someone and uh i, I don't know if we sometimes we forget that this is mm. truly about people's lives and mm. when our heartbeat is right giving uh, just shows up it just shows mm. up because we want to see people saved. We want to see them healed. We want to see the kingdom of God come in people's lives. And in heaven, there's going to be a record in heaven of, of those partnerships, those sacrifices. Sometimes it's a real sacrifice, but that sacrifice is so huge and yeah. and and it's eternal. Yeah. How good is that? I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I just uh, add something to what I said before, you know, We've been uh, in ministry a, a lot of years. We've passed a couple of churches, but we've had 26 years of itinerant ministry. And a lot of that time has been in undeveloped nations. And mm. uh, so when you go and doing, you know, pastors, conferences, or training events or whatever, you're sponsoring, and every, you're sponsoring everything for their travel to come in, their accommodation, their food, the whole thing. And through that time, God has taken care of us wonderfully. Like we, we have not lived um you know on in, in poverty street in any way we've emptied our bank accounts to go and do things but we've always you know god's always met us and here we are at this stage of life uh, with our own debt-free home our own you know a new car in the shed and you know we live well and so our testimony really is to the goodness of god uh, in his provision and it has been through partners but a lot of it has just been through our uh, I'm a strong believer in sowing and reaping, and I, uh, you know, we, we are, we are givers, and uh, we always have been, and uh, you know, I think there are biblical principles that people in itinerant ministry have to really come to terms with. And over the years, I've talked with a lot of people in itinerant ministry that have come to me and said, "How do you survive? What are you doing with this, that, and the other?" And part of the problem I've found is that they really haven't come to terms with God as their source rather than people as their mm. source. You know? And I know God provides through people and people do need to step up. I think the church needs to come to terms with this and particularly as has been mentioned, you know, that the churches need to be supporting apostolic, uh, well, not just itinerant apostles, but itinerant prophets and evangelists and, sure. and, and yeah. that sort of thing, you know, and helping them fulfill their calling. But at the end yeah. of the day for us, uh, it, we have been very careful that we always have a strong focus on God as our provider and source, and we're just going to walk it out, you know, and yeah. he has been good to us. So we yeah. are very grateful for that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, hey, I think that about wraps it up and uh, we'll stop there. There's other questions that there's somewhat been some overlap with those questions. Um, some of the questions that were sent in, really, I think we covered them. If for some reason we did not get to your question, we apologize. Uh, I apologize, but we will do our best to answer that. But I want to invite everyone who's um, part of this broadcast, whether you are actually watching this live or the replay, to connect with the Kingdom community. And we got a lot of really cool things going to be happening here soon doing um, these webinars. We've got courses. We're about to launch quite a few courses to help you. Uh, we're developing a pathway where people come to us and we're able to actually assess where they're at in terms of their journey with God, their vision, their calling, and where they want to go to be able to develop systems and, and, and processes to be able to take you to that place. And that involves connecting you with people and resources that can help you. Um, we're going to be doing a monthly mastermind with some amazing leaders from all over the globe. And it's going to be open to a small group of people. And we're bringing in uh, the heavy hitters, really, we are, 
we're going to be bringing in some people that are having huge impacts in the marketplace, um, also in other nations, and, and even impacting reaching Gen Z and other cultures uh, as well. And it's going to be people that are going to really help you. There'll be a lot of value from that. So we would love to uh, have you connect with us at the Kingdom Community. So head over to kingdomcommunity.global, click on the membership page and sign up. And um, for those of you who want to partner with us, we actually have a hundred dollar a month membership. And if you, through this video replay or the live, um, that membership gives you so many resources and, and things that you'll have access to, courses, um, on and on. We're going to do even offer some free coaching, different things as part of that. If you want to partner at that level, we are offering a discount on that. So just message me or just send an email to admin at kingdomcommunity.global and we will follow up with you. Also, if you're interested in um, broadcasting, hey, watch, download the apps and watch Kingdom Community TV. We just launched French language, Portuguese, and we're launching um, a couple of languages to reach people from India as well. But English, lots of stuff on there. And, uh, you know, we've actually got Kevin Forlong, Denise is on there as well. And if you're interested in broadcasting, having your own program on Kingdom Community TV, that's something we can certainly chat about and help you to get there as well. Download the apps, Amazon Fire, Roku, Google. Um, yeah, At the uh, of course, Apple, Apple TV, all of that stuff. A lot of people are starting to watch. We're really getting some good traction. So check it out, everyone. And I believe it will really be a, a blessing to you. We'd love for you to connect with us in the kingdom community. Welcome to the kingdom community. Many in the body of Christ long for authentic community and a spiritual family to belong to. We exist to connect, equip, and send you out into the world to fulfill your destiny and advance the kingdom of God. The Kingdom Community is unique in that we are not seeking to build a denomination or a religious organization. Our aim is to promote the Lord Jesus Christ, build up and equip His body, and advance the Kingdom to the nations of the world. We invite you to connect with us and become part of the Kingdom Community family. We are here to stand with you and celebrate your place in the body of Christ. We need each other and we are much better together. We exist to equip you to live an overcoming life and fulfill your purpose in God's kingdom. Through our live monthly training sessions, our webinars, online courses, discipleship resources, and personal mentoring, you will be transformed and equipped to make a difference in the world. Jesus said, the harvest is great and the workers are few. The Kingdom Community is here to see you released into your calling with the full manifestation of God's blessing and favor on your life. We offer apostolic covering and relational connection. The Kingdom Community has a team of seasonal leaders who can help you with guidance, counsel, coaching, and mentoring. Ministerial credentials are also available to those who qualify. The Kingdom Community is all about, one, creating an atmosphere of expectation for the supernatural. Two, strategically equipping the saints of God to fulfill their purpose in the kingdom. Three, connecting you to people and resources for personal growth, leadership development, and collaboration in mission and ministry. To learn more and to connect with us, visit our website, kingdomcommunity.global. Our website again is kingdomcommunity.global. We look forward to hearing from you.